All right, so I want to continue our discussion of the cohomology of Eilenberg McLean spaces. I guess this is part three. And again, the main reference that I'm following here is Mosher and Tangora, but there's also some good stuff in Hatcher's chapter on spectral sequences. And so last time, we showed that the map from the Steenrod algebra to the cohomology of our KZ mod 2 spaces whoops, where we take some square or sequence of squares, square capital I, and send it to apply that sequence to iota n, that this is an isomorphism for degrees less than 2n. And when I talk about the degrees here, I mean the star here, right? Um, which will correspond to the gradings of the Steenrod algebra. And this depended on this key observation which was that the squares commute with the transgression. And remember that was our longest differential in the Sayre spectral sequence in the sense that it went from uh, the q-axis down to the p-axis. And so if we, uh, if we had square i on some element that we knew transgressed, then um, the square of it also transgresses. Okay, and those commute. And now we're left with sort of what I hope is an obvious question, which is, okay, we've described the cohomology of these eilenberg mclean spaces in degrees less than 2n, but what is the cohomology in general? What do the rest of the degrees look like? So in order to uh, answer this, we'll, we'll have to work our way there. And the first thing that I wanna do is define a simple system of generators. So let me move this up. And we'll start with this definition. So we're going to be thinking about cohomology, but we can state this more generally for a graded commutative ring. Probably even for a graded ring, but I don't want to worry about it. So I have some graded commutative ring. And let's say that's over a field K. Okay, I guess I really mean that that's a graded K algebra. Um, but again, I'm sort of thinking of my example as being the cohomology of some space with coefficients in my field K. Okay, and what are we defining? We want to say what a simple system of generators is. So a simple system of generators of our ring is just going to be an ordered set basically it's going to be a nice basis so an ordered set let's say x1 x2 and so on this could be finite or not usually not such that each of these are elements of our ring and we look at monomials in these elements. Some xi1 times xi2 and so on to xir. Where these are ordered. And these form a K basis. Okay, so as a good example to keep in mind, say our ring is just polynomial in one generator, and this generator could have any degree, don't really care. This has a simple system of generators
well, what could I take? I am certainly going to need x. And if I take x squared and x to the fourth, and so on, so taking powers of 2, then I can get any power. So this is a simple system of generators. And in fact, if you knew that you had a simple system of generators, if we were going to talk about this a lot more, I would want some sort of abbreviation, because that takes a while to write. But say you have some simple system of generators for R. And let's just say we have the same thing for S. But now we'll name these Y. Oops. Well, then we can come up with a simple system of generators for the tensor product. We just take our simple systems and stick them together. So this gives me a simple system of generators oops, for the tensor product. Okay, and of course, I really mean this x1 is like x1 tensor 1, and so on, and y1 is really 1 tensor y1, and so on, but of course. Okay, so that immediately tells us that we do know how to get a simple system of generators for polynomials in multiple variables. I'm reusing the names x, but now these are the, the my polynomial generators. So this has a simple system of generators Well, what should I do? I should take the generators uh, for polynomials in each variable. And then, of course, I'm going to be taking monomials so I can multiply these together. So I just want all the xi's to powers of 2. And then this, of course, runs over the i and the k. OK, great. So uh, what, why do we care about this simple system of generators? Let's tie this back to our story. Well, we want a simple system of generators because of this powerful theorem of Borel that if we have f to e to b, oops, I keep trying to make things more readable and then I make them less readable first. Uh, but okay, if we have this uh, vibration, And let's let E be contractible, which of course we always do with our path loop vibration. Well, Borel says that if, having this problem again, okay, uh, if you know something nice about the cohomology of the fiber with coefficients in a field, in particular, if this has a simple system of generators, Well, I actually didn't want it to just be a simple system of generators, so let me say more. Let's name them. Say x alpha for alpha in some indexing set. And what I really want here is that each of these uh, x alphas is transgressive. So that's talking about in the Serre spectral sequence that we have these long differentials from edge to edge, right? then uh, the cohomology of the base, well, you actually get a really nice description of it. Let's try that again. Okay, this is just going to be polynomial on the transgressions of each of these x alphas. Okay, so uh, of course, 
the proof uses the Sayer spectral sequence. We're talking about the transgression in the Sayer spectral sequence, um, and, and that makes the most sense to do. I'm going to omit the proof for now just because I think it would take us a while and not be necessarily particularly interesting for our purposes. But let's think about what this looks like in an example. This is telling us if we know something nice about the fiber, that we have a simple system of generators, and all of those things are transgressive, then we're going to get polynomial on uh, these other generators. So let's see how that plays out in a particular example. And we might as well start small. So let's say we want to look at the cohomology of k z mod 2 2 in mod 2 coefficients. Well, I'm going to use the loop path vibration to bring k z mod 2 1 into the picture. That's, of course, loops on k z mod 2 2. Okay, and then I'll use the Sayer spectral sequence. And that the cohomology of k z mod 2 1 in mod 2 coefficients. I know, remember, that's rp infinity. And we said that z mod 2 adjoin this class uh, iota 1. So that was our fundamental class in degree 1. And just saying this is polynomial on a generator in degree 1, yes, of course, we already know that. Uh, I'm going to draw a picture of the spectral sequence. And so in this picture, a dot will be a copy of z mod 2. Okay, so I've got my grid here, and on the q-axis, I'll put the cohomology of the fiber, and the p-axis, the cohomology of the base, as usual. Okay, so of course we know the cohomology of kz mod 2 comma 1, so we should have dots in each of these spots. I'm leaving room to the left so I can write the labels. So this is like 1, iota 1, iota 1 squared, iota 1 cubed, iota 1 to the 4th, iota 1 to the 5th, and so on. Okay, and uh, we're trying to work out what the cohomology of kz mod 2, 2 is uh, using the theorem of Borel, right? Or really witnessing the theorem of Borel and, and how this plays out here. So... Uh, remember that everything needs to die except this thing in degree zero. So if I'm trying to cook up the cohomology of kz mod 2 comma 2, whoops, with coefficients in z mod 2, then I should uh, have something that I go to 1 can kill. And remember, of course, that's our fundamental class, iota 2, that we already know about. And then here we have this transgression. So that's a D2, but it also goes from edge to edge. So we call it tau, that's our transgression. And of course, we also know that uh, KZ mod 2, 2 is, is one connected. So this is a zero and zero and zero all the way up. Okay, and Maybe let me catalog this here. So we've just learned that d2 of iota 1 is tau of iota 1. It's just our, our long differential, and that's iota 2. So then I learned that d2 of iota 1 squared, well, that should be 2 iota 1 d2 iota 1 using my Leibniz rule. But of course, that's 2 times something we're working on 2, so that's going to be 0. In fact, in general, if we look at iota 1 to the 2k and apply d2, then we'll have 2k times iota 1 to the 2k minus 1, right? This is like our derivative. And that's always going to be 0 because of this 2k. But if we put in something with odd degree, well, iota 1 to the 2k plus 1, that'll give us a 2k plus 1 out here, iota 1 to the 2k, and then d2 applied to iota 1, and of course uh, that's just going to give us, well, 2k plus 1 mod 2 is just going to be 1, and then we'll have iota 1 to the 2k times 
iota 2. And so that tells me that all of these odd classes on the left are going to hit these tensor products that show up here. Remember, everything's free, so our E2 page is the tensor product. And so now uh, that tells me that iota 1 cubed should come and hit this, iota 1 to the fifth should come and hit this, and so on. Okay, so this guy gets hit. Of course, this picture continues on forever. Um, okay, where do I want to look next? Somehow that's always more obvious to me when I'm not recording a video. So I want to look at maybe uh, this class here. So that's iota 1 tensor iota 2. So what's D2 of the tensor product? I'm going to leave out the tensor symbol. Well, again, the Leibniz rule is going to give me iota 2 squared, right? Because D2 on iota 1 is iota 2, and then D2 on iota 2 is 0 for degree reasons. Um, okay, and so I get iota 2 squared, so that tells me there should be an iota 2 squared here. And this needs to come and hit that. And again, it's a D2 differential. Okay, and then I've got all of those tensor products and so on. Okay, so of course, you've played this game before, so you know how this goes. Or at least I'm hoping you have because this was one of the exercises. Okay, um, how does that sort of carry through? Well, if I look at... Um, Oh, I have something silly written down. So hold on for just a moment. Ah, never mind. That's perfectly. Uh, if I look at D2 of iota 1 times iota 2 to the K, so that's, oops, I skipped one here, but that's these sorts of products as we uh, keep going to the right. Well, what's that going to look like? Again, by the Leibniz rule, I'm just going to get iota 2 to the k plus 1. So really, uh, there should be an iota 2 cubed here, and it gets hit by this tensor product, an iota 2 to the fourth here, and that gets hit by this tensor product, and so on. And of course, then I know there are classes here. And we keep playing this game. Okay, so uh, now I want to go back to sort of trying to figure out what needs to die. So uh, the next thing I notice is that sort of this region seems to be pretty well taken care of, but this class here, iota 1 squared, needs to die. And remember, D2 didn't do the job. Okay, so uh, maybe it supports a D3 differential. And of course, we see, well, it couldn't have supported a D1. And We've already calculated D2 and it's zero, so it better support a D3 differential. So maybe let me put that in a new color. There must be something here that's D3 of this. And now this again is a transgression, right? It's going from edge to edge. So again, I'm playing this game where I started drawing the E2 page, but I'm actually drawing sort of all of the pages on top of each other. So this is a D3 differential, meaning this lived to the next page and then died there. Okay, and so just to sort of catalog what we've got, we just said that D3 of iota 1 squared, uh, well, that's going to hit this class. What should that class be? Well, the whole point of uh, this Borel theorem is that we had actually this square 1 connection. So Remember, in fact, we know a lot about the cohomology of RP infinity as a module over the Steenrod algebra. So I've got that square one. I've got a square two because it should square the class in degree two. Okay, yes. Uh, we calculated that there was a square one here and that there's a square two here. And then I think you'll find that there's a square one here and so on, right? Keeps going. Okay, so uh, square one on iota one is iota one squared, but iota one is something that transgressed to iota two. So square one on it 
must also transgress. And that actually tells me how I should name this class. This should be square one iota two. Okay, so uh, we're starting to see Borel's theorem play out here. Well, actually, I guess that's just saying that the transgression commutes with the squares, right? But what we're supposed to ultimately see is that, well, let's scroll back up. What did our Borel theorem tell us? It tells us that the Kolmogorov of the fiber, since it has a simple system of generators, if those things are transgressive, then the Kolmogorov of the base should be polynomial in the transgressions. Okay, so that's what we're trying to see. Trying to see this base, the Kolmogorov of Kz mon 2, 2, being polynomial in the transgressions. All right, I guess that's telling us that uh, the, the powers of 2, if we're going to be able to apply this theorem, the powers of 2... These are our simple systems of generators, right? And um, so the hope is that they transgress. So let's keep going and see if we can see that. I was in the middle of cataloging this one. So D3 of iota one squared, that's really tau of iota one squared. And in fact, that iota one squared is square one iota one. So yeah, we knew that should be square one tau iota one. I keep trying to dot my ones. There's too many i's and iotas flying around. Okay, and so that's square one on iota two. Okay, and indeed we we just saw that in the picture. All right. Um, now that tells me that there should be a product iota one tensor square one iota two. And if you notice, there's no room for that to support a D3 differential. And let's look at that spot. So I'm looking right here at iota one tensor square one iota two. And it can't be killed. Uh, well, okay. So this thing is already killed. It can't be, or this thing must live to the E2 page so that it can support that differential. So that doesn't kill it. That's zero that one already died on the E2 page, so nothing can hit this. So it must support a differential, and it can't support that differential or this thing wouldn't live to the E2 page, and we wouldn't get our nice Leibniz rule. So it must support a D2 differential. So let's get that in the picture. Um, I feel like I'm running out of colors a little bit, but that's just saying this class has to come and hit this. Okay, what is that class? Well, that was that came from doing D2 on iota one times square one iota two. Maybe I'll put product symbol in there. Okay, now iota one uh, is something that lives on the E2 page and square one iota two is something that lives on the E2 page. So I can use my Leibniz rule here. You have to be a little bit careful but that tells me that this is D2 iota one, square one iota two, and then plus zero, because that square one iota two is on the edge. It's differential zero for degree reasons. And so now we're getting iota two, square one iota two. And I do find it helpful to write the iota two first, otherwise it's not clear how this is a product. So that's iota two times square one iota two, and so that's what we should name this class. Okay, um, where do I want to go next? Well, I really was trying to look at the things on the edge here and see what they need to kill because we're supposed to have this simple system of transgressive generators. So I guess we've taken care of this one, this one, this one we know when it dies. The next one we don't is iota one to the fourth. Okay, so what happens to iota one to the fourth? Uh, well, we already calculated that it doesn't support a D2. It could support a D3. It could support a D4. Oh, nope, that thing is not there anymore. But it could support... Oh, now I lost track. Okay, sorry. There's no D1. There's no D2. There's no D3, D4, 
d5, okay? And right now, we don't know that there's anything there that needs to be hit, but this thing has to die somewhere. So uh, it sounds like we've just seen that it's a d3 or a d5. Maybe let me remind you once, once you get these at the bottom, the tensor product tells you you have them all the way up. I think I made this other one green. Somehow it's hard. It's easier to think this story through in order, and it's hard to say it out loud in order. Just kind of awkward, but okay. Uh, we just said we wanted to check if there was a D3 on iota 1 to the 4th, or maybe a D5. If we compute D3, well, can I even use a Leibniz rule here? Notice that iota 1 to the 4th is iota 1 squared, and I... Uh, so I can use the Leibniz rule, I think of this as iota 1 squared times iota 1 squared. So that's really 2 iota 1 squared times d3 of iota 1 squared. And that all was defined, right? All that stuff lived to the e3 page, so that was okay. But now I've got that 2 times something, so it's 0. So just to be really clear, there was no d1, there was no d2. We calculated and we just calculated it doesn't support a d3. There's nothing here, d4, that it can hit. If you look at this spot, that one already supports something, and there's nothing sort of back and to the left uh, that needs to hit, except maybe this. Okay, uh, I guess we could think about d4, but, but maybe let me just get to the point since this video is already getting a bit long. We actually know that d5 of iota 1 to the 4th, uh, well, that's our transgression applied to, this is square 2 applied to iota 1 squared, and the transgression commutes with the square, so this has to be square 2 of tau iota 1 squared. And what was tau? Well, for iota 1 squared, that was on the e3 page. So that was really square two of d3 iota one squared, which we found was square one iota two. Okay, so actually there is another class here. And maybe let me just label right below here. There's also square two, square one iota two living in this spot. Okay, so, uh, and the, the theorem about the transgression commuting with the, um, with the Steenrod squares tells us that yes, this really does have to come and hit here. Okay, and so again, we have that tau, that transgression. Okay, and notice, by the way, we're starting to see down here in the base that we've got some polynomial stuff, iota 2, squared, cubed, and so on. Um, we've got square 1 iota 2, but we've also got products of these two, right? iota 2 times square 1 iota 2. Then I see, oh, here is uh, something that looks like it came from the transgression. Oh, right, my squares commute with the transgression. And then I should see a bunch of polynomial stuff in all of these transgressive things. So I guess if we wanted to prove really that we know something about the cohomology of KZ mod 2, 2, then we need to make sure that we know sort of who is transgressive over here. And then we'll say that this is polynomial on those generators. Okay, so we'll, uh, in the next video, make that really precise.